Hey guys, Crazy Aaron here. Welcome to another episode of The Crazy Aaron Show, where we take a look at the fascinating parts of our incredible and vast world that have inspired my Thinking Putty creations. Let's get started. Last time we were back in the coral reef, and now you probably know what coral are, but did you know how they form, or the creatures that inhabit them, actually different species working together in symbiosis to make food, and that they're flexible in many cases. They're not all stony and hard, and if they are, how do they grow and shrink and move around? Well, check it out in the video archive, and we even had an opportunity to make a tube coral out of thinking putty. If you want to do that yourself, well, go check it out. Today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite hobbies, photography. I've been interested in capturing images ever since I was a little boy. And back then, we didn't have iPhones, so we used cameras with, you know, photographic film, a little strip that would magically take a picture and you'd send it off and it would come back and the pictures would be on there and you would get prints. It was incredible, but very different than how we take pictures today. So let's find out more. So today photography is digital. You've got cameras on your phone. There's surveillance cameras watching you wherever you go. Cameras are everywhere, but it didn't used to be that way. It used to be that you needed a strip of plastic or uh, celluloid and you would coat it with special chemicals, you would expose it to light, you would keep it secretly in the dark, then you would process it with different chemicals and the image, the latent image that had been exposed would be revealed either as a negative or in some cases as a positive and you could use that to then make photographic prints. It seems like a lot of work to do what now happens in the blink of an eye for free because keep in mind every time you click that shutter it cost money every time you went to get your film developed it cost money and you couldn't see the pictures you took you'd have to wait even with an instant camera you would have to wait 60 seconds or two or three minutes before you would be able to see the photo not like today at all but there's still something about that you know crazy Aaron loves chemistry chemistry can be like magic because how do you actually make a picture appear before your very eyes on a Polaroid? Or how do you take pictures on a strip of plastic and then magically when you get it back in the mail, poof, it's got photos on it, your photos. Of course, you discover all the things you did wrong, the finger over the lens, uh, you forgot to turn on the flash, it's out of focus, whatever it was, you would discover that after the fact, far after you had the opportunity to take that picture again truly a different world. I wanted to feature for you today one of my favorite and most interesting cameras. A camera in my collection called the Globuscope. Look at that. Not your traditional camera. Ron Globus, the inventor of the Globuscope, he wanted to make a camera that would be able to take a 360 degree panorama. He wanted to do it with something you could hold in your hand. People had been taking panoramas, wide images, trying to almost create what we call today VR, right? But it was 2D, it was just one image, and it was very big and it would be printed on a piece of paper. But those cameras weighed 60, 80, 100 pounds. You had to transport them, everyone had to hold still. He wanted something that was a little more on the go. And so he invented the Globuscope. The way it worked is you would load the film and then you would twist the camera like this. And when you would press the button, it would unwind, dragging the film across that slit you see, and it would expose a 360 degree image. You can see an example here. And you can see in this picture, everything is sort of frozen in time. It's a little fuzzy, it's not perfect, but it was the best you could do, especially handheld, in 1981. Well, I had the opportunity to meet Ron Globus, I was really one of my best, most favorite inventor moments. 
But it wasn't until I had actually learned how to make this camera, how to assemble it by hand. See, here's the story. I wanted a Globuscope. Look at this thing. It looks so cool. The design is so unique. It's actually in the Museum of Modern Art as an exhibit. Not a lot of cameras get that. It also did something that no other camera did, which was to take 360 degree panoramas in your hand. Um, the other part of the camera that was really neat, well, it just had a look that got people's attention. They had no idea what it was. In fact, it was so cool looking, it was used in movies as a prop of some futuristic spacey device. So Dan Aykroyd would hold it in Ghostbusters and go, Ooh, and move it around and read and find out if there were ghosts. Of course, there were always ghosts. I wanted this camera, but it was extremely expensive, thousands of dollars. And I would look and I would look, and I would go on eBay and I would look, and it was too much money. And then one day, I found one. The only problem was it was a box of disassembled parts. Someone had taken one of these cameras, it broke, they thought they could take it apart to fix it, and what they ended up with was a pile of nuts and bolts and springs and dials, and they had no idea what to do, and so they sold it to me cheap. Well, I spent about six months reading Ron Globus's patents, pouring through his different drawings, and slowly and carefully reassembling the camera, fixing what was actually broken with it, and then getting down to work. I was able to refocus this camera, make it work perfectly, and that's what you see in these images here. Well, if you like those, there's more camera stories, but I'll tell you the last piece of the Globioscope magic. When I was reassembling this and I was almost done, I realized that here in the shaft, there was a special material that went and it held the spring back so it didn't just zing and go too fast, right? It had to go at a constant speed. It needed what we call a governor, something to control or govern the speed of the spring as it unwound. What was that governor? Well, in reading Ron's patents, I realized it was one of the main ingredients that ultimately became our liquid glass thinking putty. Of all the people in all the world who would put one of these cameras back together, who would have that strange and mysterious substance already on his shelf? Crazy Aaron. I poured it in. I guessed at exactly the right mix and viscosity using my experience. I put it back together. I spun it up and you know what? It was perfect the first time. I was so proud of myself. I just ran around the house trying to show everybody I could my Globuscope. They gave me funny looks for sure, as I'm sure you're doing now, but remaking this antique camera was a very special moment. Later on, I got to go up to New York City and meet Ron just as he was closing up shop and getting ready for his long retirement. It was an honor to meet him, and when I told him that I had reassembled the camera from scratch, he looked at me and said, wow, you really are crazy. I think he was impressed. I hope you like that story. Let me tell you a little bit more about cameras, specifically the two cameras that you have built into your body right now. That's right, your eyes. Your eyes are cameras. Your eyes have a lens. They have film or a fi receptor for the light on the back. That's your retina. And they can move and change shape so that the eye can adjust to meet whatever depth of field and focus is required. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Focus is that what you're looking at is sharp, that all of the light rays are converging in one spot, and your lens can squeeze and change shape. Most cameras, they move like this, back and forth to adjust, but your lens squeezes, and in doing so, it can move the focal point backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, until it's just right on the retina. All of this happens automatically, but you can test it out. If you hold your finger right here and you focus on your fingertip, you'll notice that the background gets very fuzzy. Conversely, if you focus on something in the background, you'll notice that your finger gets very fuzzy. That is your lens adjusting your focus. 
Now I want you to try that a second time. I want you to go into a dark room and do the same thing after your eyes adjust. Not total darkness, but dim, dim, right? And you look here and you see that out of focus. And you look in the background and you see that the finger goes out of focus. Now I want you to do it on a sunlit day, really bright out. And what you'll notice if you can keep that memory in your mind is that outside in the sun, it's not nearly as blurry in the distance when you focus on your finger. And it's not nearly as blurry on your finger when you focus in the distance. But in a dim room, the blur is so much more. That describes depth of field. That is, depending on how open or closed your iris is, that's the colored part of your eye that gets big when it's dark to let in more light, or closes to a pinpoint in bright sunlight so that too much light doesn't get in and hurt the receptors in your retina. When that closes, it increases the depth of field. That is the total distance that can be in focus at one particular time. So sometimes you might say everything from 15 feet into infinity all the way into the deepest part of the horizon would be in focus at once. And if you focused on something a little closer, say maybe eight feet away, then something very far away would also go out of focus. It's like it shifts back and forth. You can't have it all. In fact, many new cameras you notice have different lenses. My iPhone has three lenses and the computer inside the iPhone is taking three pictures at once at different focal lengths, different widths, and different depths of field, and then computationally combining them together so that you can have whichever photo you want. But back in the day, with a single lens camera, you couldn't do that. And with your eye, you can't do that. Everything can't be in focus all at once. Now, it changes as you look at things. Your eye is reactive to the brain, right? So maybe you don't notice until you think about it. But now that you think about it, I bet you'll notice it all the time. I wanted to tell you a little bit about color photography and color printing. You know that white light is comprised of all the different colors and we can break them apart with a prism to show the red, the green, and the blue. We have sensors in our eyes, different cells in our retina that receive red, green, and blue light and then in our brain combine them back together to all the colors that we see. That's called additive light where we add different wavelengths of light to make a color. If we are reflecting light off of a piece of paper, we need to use subtractive color. And that uses magenta, cyan, yellow, and black. You can see here, I've got this nice picture of the girl with the pearl earring. And we're gonna add the different layers of color. It's called CMYK. Look, there she is, now she's in color. If I take away the C, she looks kind of pink. If I take away the pink and I add it back, she looks kind of C, right? Ooh, I dropped it. But with all of them, it's a full color image. Let's look at that again. Here she is in black and white. I'm gonna put that down here. And then we're going to add the different color layers. C, M, Y, K. K is black. C is cyan, uh, Y is yellow, and M is magenta. You can see there she is. She's a little fuzzy. We're going to fix the registration. That is, that making sure they all line up just right. And look, there is a nice color picture. Look at that. Now I want to show you how you can project a black and white image onto your thinking putty. All right, so we've got our cryptic code thinking putty, and I've already taken it out of the can and flattened it here so we can make a nice flat surface to press our photographic negative onto. Okay, and we've got it here, so we're just gonna put her down like that. We're gonna press so there's no air bubbles and the negative is directly in contact with the putty. It's called making a contact print. You can see why. Now I've got this massive light here. This is like, I don't know, 36 or 48 glow chargers all at once. And I'm just gonna move it around so it gets a nice even exposure. Okay, now here we can't really overexpose 
because it will fade away. It's not like a permanent exposure, but we'll do that. And then we'll peel this back. And look, there she is. Look at that. And you can compare it with the actual print. I've got a mirror image printed here. There. Yeah. 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 So this is a photo print made on fancy paper from that same negative. There you go. Of course, if you want to give this a try yourself, grab a ghostwriter, head over to puttyworld.com, amazon.com, or even better, check out your local specialty toy store. I know they have all the best selection of our latest product. Well, I've got a letter here. This one comes from Allison, and Allison lives in Tennessee. And she included a lot of awesome, awesome stickers on this envelope. Thank you, Allison, to brighten my day. I'm going to open this up. I'm going to try and save these stickers, keep them in my office. Let's see what we've got here. Dear Crazy Aaron, my name is Allison. I am 10 years old. I live in Chattanooga, uh, and I am homeschooled. I make sure I tune into your live stream every day. Well, thank you, Allison. I have 35 thinking putties, and I use them while my mom reads our history books. Two of my favorites are Chocolata and Orangesicle. I have a few questions. How, does it, how long does it take to make a hypercolor putty? Allison, I'll tell you, it takes ooh, maybe almost a full day to make thinking putty. The specific color doesn't matter quite as much, although some colors do take a little bit longer than others, but it does take many, many hours to mix it just right much longer than maybe when you're making slime at home. Which putty is your favorite? You know I love Super Oil Slick. It's so metallic and shiny, and I love how if you fold it just right, you can see your own reflection in it. It's great. Uh, you do enjoy the Ultimate Putty Challenge, and will you please write me back? Of course I will. If you would like to get a letter back from me personally, Crazy Aaron, then you need to write me at Crazy Aaron, 700 East Main Street, Norristown, PA, 19401. I look forward to getting your letter and we'll be sure to write you back. Well, that's about all we have time for today. So I'm going to say bye-bye.